Okay. So it's now 6.30, so I think we can call the meeting to order. Uh, let's see, uh, establishment of a quorum. Monique? Oh, sorry. Um, all right, roll call vote then. Uh, President Wheeler? Here. Vice President Bella? Here. Director Zuka? Here. Director Jordan? Here. And Director Schmidt? Here. Uh, we have a quorum, all five directors are present. Okay. Do, let's see, public comments. Do we have any members of the public who signed in? Not that we're aware of. I don't see anybody. Okay. And I think, and nobody submitted any public comments yet? No, no written comments, no. Item three, agenda review. Additions, deletions, full consent items. Any board members have issues with the agenda and the consent calendar. Hearing none, we can proceed to item four, acknowledgements and presentations. We have none that around the agenda? That's correct. Sounds good. And item five, the consent agenda. Um, Kirk? Yes. Okay, a couple of quick things. Um, on the minutes, um, we have uh, some that needs, that needs to be corrected probably. What page are you on, Lewis? Okay, hold on a second. On the minutes, we would be on page five. And the line on page so, five? So page five would be line 89. There was a roll call motion past four zero. That couldn't be because there was only three of us at the time. No, I think that was after I came in. Nope, nope, nope. Because then you look at line 127, that's when you came in. Yeah. See that. <clears throat> so the roll call motion okay. passed. Okay, it should have been three, three zeros. So three eyes, zero nose. That's how that that's how that motion was passed. Okay. Okay. I can correct that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a, a small correction. That's all. All right. Do we need a Anything? motion? Do we need Anything a motion? Else, Lewis? No, that's it for me. Anyone else? Thank you. Uh, Kirk, I had a question. Certainly. And this is for uh, the accounts payable expenditures, uh, page, that's page 11. Um, just, I wanted to, if that could say anything about one item at the near the top of $5,800 to San Mateo Daily Journal. That was for the advertising of the water resources coordinator, I believe. Is that, is that right, Monique? Do you remember that? I don't think that is no one. I think, no. I think that was the Hastings Service Connection. Oh, um, that, yeah. Okay. That the job, the, the yes. The, yeah. So that we put we job. put the plans at the Dodge House and the capital project at Right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's what it was for, the capital project. So that's all for one ad? Yes. It that's runs it runs several times. I think we run it three to five times. That's our protocol. So I think it was three at least three times I saw it in the paper. Yeah, and it's expensive. It is. We can shrink that up though. I've I've talked to Monique about that when she runs ads. So I think we can talk to Vic about that in the future too. It's the way we submit it to them. We just need to tell them what type and what size ad we want to purchase. Public agencies are keeping newspapers alive. Yes. <laughs> and, and obituaries, I guess. It, it's it, contractors, they don't all go to the Dodge House. And so we always try to reach out to the local paper in case you know they can say that it was there and it was competitive. Yeah. 
Seems a little pricey, but it's pricey. They've gotten more expensive for sure. It's gotten more expensive, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? I'm not seeing any hands or people talking, so uh, we can entertain a motion. I'm I'll so approve the consent. Jen? I'll second. Okay, we can call the roll. Director Schmidt. Yes. Vice President Vela. Yes. Uh, Director Zuka. Yes. Director Jordan. Yes. And uh, did I miss somebody? Me. The President. President. Oh, Wheeler. President Wheeler. I'm like, I know that that was only four. Yes. You need some coffee, Monique. Uh, yes, I think I do. Okay, great. Motion passes five to zero. Okay. Uh, item six, hearing and appeals. There's no on the agenda. No change since the agenda? No changes. Okay. Item seven, capital improvement program and 2016 COP certificates. Yes, yeah, so Kat. All right. So this one is very similar to uh, a notice of um, completion that you considered last month for different projects and that I'm coming in right at the end and getting to take some credit and saying project's done. Um, so this is for the El Camino Real water main replacement project, um, which consisted of replacing about 3,800 feet of main along El Camino, um, a complicated project. It uh, was awarded early last year with notice to proceed given in February. Um, and you know, you, you've, you've heard previously about this project because um, you know the, the contractual working uh, days period was 180 days, but due to a late start um, that the engineer or that the con contractor chose themselves, um, it, the project ended past that 180 day period. And so as a result, the contractor um, owed us liquidated damages for 31 days. Um, and as a, a bit of a surprise to our team, the contractor filed um, actually nine claims against the district. Um, although, you know, we had, the, the project team had asked multiple times for any information, um, for extra charges and had got basically no response from them. Um, so Tammy um, was very successful in meeting with the contractor um, and reached a settlement within um, you know, the board's authorized amount. Um, and so, you know, while yes, this there were some frustrations here at the end, um, the project was altogether, you know, quite a successful project itself. Um, and I think, you know, Jubin can talk a bit more about the change orders um, and, and anything else he wants to add. Yeah, thanks, Kat. Uh, the, the meeting that Tammy had with the contractor was uh, the date of the board meeting last, last month. So we orally reported out. I think that's the right way to say it. <laughs> we, we, uh, we reported out to the board uh, what we settled on. But what we wanted to do was come to the board with a written report to uh, basically memorialize what was settled last uh, last month, right? So um, the dollars uh, before you are the final settlement of amounts. The board takes action by accepting the project. And what this does is it triggers the notice of completion to be filed with the county. And uh, in this case, it's kind of a formality because we've already checked with the folks that owed, uh, had filed a preliminary lien notice on the project just to make sure all the subcontractors and suppliers and vendors and everybody has been paid. So that's already been taken care of. We have final lien releases from them. So we know everybody's been paid. We've already paid out the, to the contractor the final settlement amount, which was 100 and uh, I don't have that number in front, 195,000. <laughs> so the only thing left is the uh, retention that we're holding, the 5% retention, which is about 104,000. And after the notice of completion is filed, typically we wait for a little while, but in this case, we don't really necessarily have to wait because um, we've already checked to make sure everybody's been paid. So we wanna close this out. 
And as far as what the final settlement amount works out to, I, I did a very small chart. I tried to keep it minimal. That's on page 20, uh, Monique, if you could scroll down there. Basically what they were asking for, what we thought was was uh, they were owed and what we settled on finally. And um, so that's uh, that that was the that was the you know uh, the final numbers. And then at the very end, at the very bottom paragraph, it works out to about eight percent change order for the project. Our average, if you recall, is about three percent. And so this is this is still below the ten percent that the board authorized at the very beginning of the project for contingency. So um, that was somewhat the target that Tammy was reaching for, and we were able to come in under that. So, um, yeah, the project is all closed out as we reported out last month. This is just more paperwork um, to make sure that uh, it, it gets documented and the board sees it in writing rather than just a verbal last month. So, any questions Kat and I can answer for you? If not, we'd, we'd love a uh, authorization yeah. to file the notice of completion. Yeah, I, I believe we uh, we did talk about that at the last meeting as well, right, Jubin? And I yes. think the I think the word you were looking for was uh, verbally. <laughs> Ver yes, <laughs> not orally, verbally. Yes, yeah. thank you. No, thank orally, you. orally is when you when you take a pill. <laughs> yes, I, I, I apologize. Unless, I, I, unless after, this was a pill, I don't know. <laughs> after, I think either works personally, but uh, <laughs> yeah. after after this project, I I don't know what which word. No, works I, best, I, but, uh, I, yeah, I'll I just said I just said that Juba was kind of questioning himself, so I just wanted to help out. That's all. I I, I do that all the time, Lewis. And uh, <laughs> as soon as I said it, you know, you know, when you say something and it just doesn't sound right, so <laughs> yes. I, I apologize for that. <laughs> so, um, for the sake of um, accuracy, I I guess you know, when you say now, therefore, on page seventeen, oh. number two, since uh, Tammy is was the general manager, but now we have an interim general manager or an assistant general manager. Should that be um, left as general manager or should that reflect who is going to actually approve this? What do you think, Julie? I think we should put interim in front. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that uh, that will okay. probably be more. So we'll add interim right there where the cursor is. Right, right before general. Yeah. And uh, with that, um, I will move to a consider resolution 20, 2022-30, accepting as complete the El Camino Real water main replacement project and authorizing the recordation of a notice of completion for the project. I'll second. Okay, we can move to a vote. Monique? You're muted, I think. I was calling roll, but nobody could hear me. <laughs> oh, that's coffee, uh, Monique. That's <laughs> coffee. Director Vella. <laughs> Director Vella? Yes. Director Zuka? Yes. Director Jordan? Yes. Director Schmidt? Yes. And President Wheeler. Yes. Okay. Vote. Yay, uh, motion. <laughs> motion passed. Pre yeah, President, without President coffee. Vella, uh, President Villa, can I say one thing before we move on to the next uh, uh, item? Vice I, President Villa. Uh, sure. I, I wanted to just say that typically these negotiations, those that have been involved with contractors, take multiple meetings, and are you know there's a lot of back and forth, and I just wanted to. Uh, Tammy's not my boss anymore. She's obviously <laughs> retired. So this is not a this is not a, a, a kiss up or anything. But I just wanted to say that she did an amazing job negotiating with the contractor and, and being able to resolve this in one meeting. I mean, it was uh, it was quite, quite amazing to see um, this not drag on because uh, the more it drags on, the more costs there are, obviously, you know, there's a lot more consultants and, and so forth. And to be able to knock it out in one meeting uh, was quite, quite amazing thing to see. And I just wanted the board to. Um, I just wanted to let the board know that it was done in one meeting, and and uh, what a great job Tammy did. So, thank you. Thank you, Jubin. And I'm not retired yet. My retirement date's April first, 2023. <laughs> I'm still at work. I will be retiring though. But thank you. April yeah, it was different yeah. than the last meetings we've had. I mean, I've had several of these with contractors, and you know, we just avoided details because we had talked for months about details and. 
and it was just Kurt and me, Kurt Mitchell and me, and we just went back and forth and I got a handwriting that day while he taught, chatted with Brenna mm -hmm. and then we got signature and we were able to move on. So I'm, I'm glad because it was a good project mm -hmm. and I just didn't want this stain on it at the end, you know, especially since we just were, were successful in getting one of the largest projects for this district accomplished. So mm -hmm. appreciate that acknowledgement. Yeah. And, and one thing, yeah. Uh, and I'm glad to, to say that you, uh, eliminated the, the details because if, if you bring the details, they will bring the details. And then you bring more details and they will bring even more details. I mean, we've right. seen this over and over again. And and as time passes, the dollar signs keeps on going up because of the right. expenses and all that. So I had one sheet, he brought in his big notebook. I said, yeah. so what, what's the bottom line? What do you want? That was the words, first words. And I he goes, whoa, we're not gonna talk about this big notebook. I said, no, yeah. we, we've been talking, we got a notebook, you got a notebook, no. We're the principals. Exactly. I have board authority. What do you want? <laughs> so we just started there and, and it became, you know, evident yeah. that he was interested in the same thing too. So I'm glad. I'm glad for him and I'm glad for the district and for yeah. the project. Yeah. Good work. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Then moving on to, uh, let's see, where are we? 7B. 7B. Yeah, so this, I'm gonna let Jubin talk about this, but I just want a little preface here. Uh, if you recall a couple of years ago, we came to the board in one of the summer meetings, it was in uh, June or July, I think it's 2020 or 2020, or 2020 uh, to ask you to reject the bids for the De COVID tank project, capital project. You recall, we put that out to bid, we had a, an engineer's estimate of about $4 million and the bids, the lowest bid came in a little over $5 million. And it was related to material costs at the time. Things were just really out of whack. And I think they still still remain kind of a, a little out of alignment in terms of material costs. Now, of course, now you have supply chain issues. But at that time when we rejected it, we said, well, what we wanna do is we wanna take a look at our, our water storage needs throughout the entire district because we noticed that there was some changing in water use um, uh, with our customers, you know. So we asked Jubin and his folks to, to take a look at uh, our water storage capacity. Now here, you know, recently in, in uh, August, the, uh, the grand jury issued their report. And one of the items they, they issued in the report is they, they recommended that all the water regions in San Mateo County should have an emergency storage capacity for at least three days, you know. so. The, the timing of uh, that grand jury report and just work that we were looking at reporting to the, the board with regards to the district storage capacity was just right. So uh, Jubin and his team have prepared this report and I'm gonna let him take over and explain what they uh, did and what they found. Jubin. Yeah, thanks Rena. So uh, this is actually an update uh, to a report that um, we did um, several years ago and uh, it's a good idea to do this every few years just to get an idea of where we are with our storage and our tank sizes. And uh, it, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation as far as when usage goes down or usage goes up and our, our emergency storage. And so I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly. I know you guys have a closed session, uh, but I would love to, I'm an engineer, so I'd love to dive into this. If you wanna get in touch with me one-on-one -on -one or meet with me or or we could do a Zoom chat. And I know we have a couple of engineers on the board, so I, I know they'd love to get, it, get into this stuff. But uh, uh, if you go to the next page graphically, um, uh, actually one more page, sorry, page three, right there, that's, that's perfect. So graphically we're talking about, this is what a tank looks like, right? Uh, when, when we look at um, a, a storage, we have, uh, even though a tank is a million gallons, you don't actually have a million gallons of water in there. Right, you, you have to take out freeboard, you take out dead storage, which is storage that we don't use. Uh, then you take out the operational side, that's where pumps turn on and pumps turn off. You have to have some uh, uh, storage for fire in there. And then finally, once you subtract all of that out, you end up with how much water you have left for emergency purposes. And uh, for the sake of this study and, and what we've done in the past, which is somewhat common, in the industry also is that we looked at the district as a whole because all of our zones were lucky enough to be able uh, are connected uh, for the most part. So storage in one zone can feed, feed water to another zone. 
And so we've done a really good job, we being the district, of making sure that those interconnections work really well. Because with those interconnections, we can look at the storage as a whole uh, uh, throughout the district. And we're also uh, somewhat in a uh, uh, foster city and, and some of the other districts are like this too on the peninsula in that they have the flat area down in zone one where we don't have any storage, right? So we have a lot of usage down at the very bottom in the industrial area, but we don't have any storage in that zone. So uh, uh, water from the other uh, zones or storage in the other zones would uh, technically backbeat. Worst case scenario we looked at, essentially worst case being that we're getting zero water from the Hetch Hetchy system. Once you cut that off, we assumed some fires going on within the district. So we're, we're, we're assuming after an earthquake, there's some fires. So we assumed some of that. And then we backed into how much water uh, we have as far as emergency goes. So a couple of things that went on from this last study to this study in that our usage came down, right? We, we keep talking about our usage coming down, which is great um, because of the drought. Uh, but what happens is when usage comes down, uh, that affects water quality, right? So what, what happens is that we can't keep our tanks full because the water starts degrading. Uh, the, the disinfectant in the water starts degrading. So that means that we actually can't operate the tank as full as we could. So that operational green uh, or blue band gets bigger, right? Because then we can't, we're not, uh, we're operating the tanks differently than we would when there was a lot of storage. So when I say it's not intuitive, as far as when usage goes down, you would think that you'd have more emergency storage, right? But it, it, we're operating the district differently and we have to because, or else the water goes bad. Now there's, uh, so if we just go skip all the way to the end to the recommendations part, uh, thanks Monique, uh, basically, uh, that oh, one, there we go. Um, one, one, one more up. Uh, there we go. So those are the those are the uh, recommendations that we have. Some of them state the same. The biggest one was number two. The whole reason we took over this study was, can we get away with not having as much storage in the system because uh, usage is going down? And this study basically proved out that no, we still need the two tanks at Decoven. Um, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, because of the, 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 the how we operate the system. But the good thing is, as part of the Decoven tank project, we've already put in a chlorine booster station as part of that uh, project. So what that means is that we don't have to rely 100% on the disinfectant, pro, uh, disinfectant coming in from the Hetch Hetchy system. Now we're going to have a way to boost it ourselves and get more days and more emergency storage. So once that system goes in, with the reconstruction of the Coven tanks, we will be able to um, increase some of our emergency storage. So, and then there's there's other um, there's other recommendations in there. But essentially, we take a snapshot of the district, uh, see how we operate it. We take that snapshot and we put it into this report, and we see how much uh, storage we have. So. Um, that's as best as I could do without diving into the details. So I'll see. I'll see uh, if there's any questions I can answer, or or please see me at, offline, and I'd love to dive into this more. So, hey, Jubin. Yes, sir. Can I ask you one good question? This is a big what if. Okay, I mean this yes, is sir. really splitting the hair ten times over. The the dead water in a dire dire emergency. How complicated would it be to drop a pump, filter that water, and feed it back into the discharge? Because there is quite a bit of water. Right, right, right. So the dead water, essentially, that Louis, uh, uh, President you, Bella is referring to is the, is the portion of the water that's uh, below the discharge pipe. So the discharge pipe is not right at the very bottom of the tank. It sits up about two or three feet. Right. So there's water there. So what would happen in, in a case that we want to use that water for any kind of purpose, we would have to open up a hatch on the side of the tank that, that is right around uh, close to the discharge side, drop a pump in like uh, uh, President Villa was referring to. And I would not put that water back into the system because what would happen is that we would then have to, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I keep saying President Villa, I think it's Vice, Vice, Vice President. I, I'm, I'm Thank so you. sorry. President Thank Wheeler, you. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm 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 screwing up your left and right. So I apologize. Maybe coffee for that. too. I, I maybe too much coffee. So um, 
But I, I, I wouldn't bring that water back, that. Uh, uh, Vice President Vela, because that wa yeah. if we do that, then it's um, we, we're we're not. No, you have to you have to filter it somehow because uh, that that water has a lot of silt in it and and all the the stuff you know. So right, there's, there's, there's typically not a lot of silt. I mean, we've gone into tanks and there might be an inch or two of silt. I, I've not seen one of our tanks yet that has a couple of feet of silt in, but. The, the chances are the water has very little disinfectant in it. So we probably want to have the ability to put some disinfectant in the water to make sure. Cor that correct. But what, what I was referring to right now, but that's why I said a dire, dire, dire emergency yeah. is, it could be done. is you need, you need some water, let's say for, for fire, you have something burning that, that you need some water in some system. And, and you know that you have that storage still there. It's on tap and, you go like if I could only put that into the system, you know, I, I could. That, that's what I'm saying. You know, I mean, you you don't yeah. you that don't plan be, for it. You know, that would be one of our last options. We would probably Correct. looking at other tank to see how, and and also our pressure regulating valves and see if we can open something up and move water in, into a particular zone. As mm -hmm. Jubin said, we have the the capability of moving water downhill from Hallmark West Palmont down towards Zone One or we have the ability to pump water back uphill as well, you know, so we would be taking a look at those options, but you make a good point, you know, and in, in, in the last ditch, you know, uh, uh, effort, you know, we could technically open up a hatch and put a pump in there, but it, it wouldn't be, I don't know how big a pump we could put in there. <laughs> you it, know? it would be, yeah, uh, correct. Uh, it, it would but also yeah. be that, that we would have to uh, issue a boil order um, yeah. You know, yeah. alert because this would not be drinkable water at that point. May not be. Um, Correct. Well, yeah. if, if we're if we're introducing it in a pump and a hose and, and other things that um, but there there is a way to do it, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Lewis, but mm -hmm. it, it, it would be a very, very last resort. And we Correct. don't have a pump big enough to be able to feed a fire hydrant. Right. If, if we're talking about so it would be basically for household usage at that point um, throughout the zone. Yeah. yeah, but if it's if it's one of the, the high elevation tanks um you could still have the gravity right right yeah so yeah but what i'm saying is uh, I, I know i hope to god that we will never even have to think about some stuff like this but in a report if you're doing that you know they go like oh my god they even thought about that which is something which is almost like an impossibility but hey you know um it's that's why i said a dire dire emergency that's all all right good thank you Kirk, Brian has his hand up. Brian? Thanks. I had a question um, and a general comment. Um, so going to page 34 with recommendations, um, talking about public notification and education before and after a catastrophic event. Um, I was wondering if part of that might be something where we'd want to do an outdoor irrigation ban to try and extend our water supply and maybe in a way that's a little different from way we do just in a normal drought where in a normal drought we go through long periods of education to get people to not do their outdoor irrigation and here basically we, we would want the hammer to drop rather immediately yeah i'm thinking in particular maybe we'd want to go to go to the city of belmont and and have some type of cooperative agreement where they can use their they can make it a misdemeanor or something like that if uh, if in that type of emergency and we need to stop. I think, I think the community would be looking for the district and the board to be looking at what could be done, you know, in a dire situation to reduce water use. And they'd be looking for us to do something like that, you know, so it would be something that we would want to probably do, but you know, there, there would probably be an emergency board meeting where the board might take some action like that, you know, and Julie would be there to, to help us if we could get her on the phone or, or uh, in a Zoom meeting, depending on the, the situation. But yeah, I, I you see your point. You know, you're going to want to reduce any extraneous water use on a system when there's a, a major natural disaster like that. And outdoor use would be one of them. It'd be the focus on, uh, you know, using the water for inside domestic purposes, you know, uh, health and sanitary purposes, not, not outside. And so, uh, you know, I'm sure that to the extent that we had the ability to, to go around the community and or maybe make use of uh, the police department, local police department, just going out there and, you know, talking through a speakerphone or a megaphone or something like that, letting people know not to use water outside would be one of the things that we would probably try and exercise 
just to inform the community to try and, and reduce the outdoor water use in a natural disaster emergency. Yeah. This well, would be like there's two uh, possibilities. One is just do public education and hope everyone complies. Right. And I I suspect it'd be pretty good. Um, the other possibility though is is like have a legal hammer. Yeah. Happening with this. And if we're thinking we want that one, I don't think that's something we try and set up after an earthquake. Something we want want to have set up beforehand. I think there's the city council will have a lot of other things to do besides figure out how to make it a misdemeanor to irrigate your your lawn for the for the time. Uh, Director Schmidt, I I could tell you that this would be um, this would be something that we want to activate uh, immediately, right? We, we, we because hours count and people's lawn irrigations are on timers, right? And and if there's electricity, they'll fire off. And every every drop of water that we can save that's not being put on irrigation is is a water saved for uh, you know health and safety. So um, I could see your point. Uh, so th this conservation education we, we were looking at it. Maybe it's not the right term to use, but this is basically educating that hey, after an emergency, after an earthquake, you think about gas, right? You you know there's education as far as if you smell gas, you go turn off your gas uh, and so forth. But there's very little thought as far as, hey, go turn off your irrigation. You know, your plants aren't going to die for a week while we try to figure out leaks in the system. And that's not something typically um, uh, customers think about after an earthquake, right? They think about other stuff, but they're not really thinking about their lawn or, or mm -hmm. irrigation. And that's what we were thinking about education. And um, some of the other water districts, uh, one being Parisima down in Los Altos Hills, they use a lot of outdoor irrigation, right? So uh, if an earthquake happens during the summer and those irrigations fire off, that's that's a catastrophe for them. So they've put a lot of effort into um, education. Also, they do have that hammer. So um, it's something that I can I could pass along to Rena. Um, you know, uh, but a lot of that stuff is set up ahead of time. So sounds like Cuban, you and Rena might be thinking about this and figuring out potential next steps. And and you know the the next item on the the board's agenda is the presentation of the website John John Davidson so we use John a lot for trying to get messaging out to the community so you know one of the things could be to start thinking about how we could uh, educate our community here uh, in terms of what you know they may want to be thinking about in the in the event of a natural disaster in their water supply you know so how how we get that message out and we could talk to John about that uh, and see how we might want to you know again try to get people to thinking about uh, natural disasters and on the water side, what do you want to do versus, you know, on, on the, the city side or the PG side, how you shut your gas meter off or something like that. And okay. consider adding it to your ERP and actually do a tabletop exercise where you do put together something to let customers know, have 72 hours worth of water supply, make sure you turn your irrigation off and get people start to think about what mm -hmm. happens in a catastrophic event. Mm -hmm. So we can just add that to our list with our emergency response plan. And Rena, I was just going to also point out that the water shortage contingency plan does contemplate this shortages of over 50%. Um, so there, there are some mechanisms in there as well. Um, since we'd be you know, catastrophic, um, we certainly fall under 50% shortage. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well... Uh... A uh, general comment that I have is, uh, first of all, I found this uh, really helpful to read this and to get this kind of 30,000 foot overview. Um, there is a but coming up to that, um, which is I, I feel like I, I got a bit of a trend, well, I shouldn't call it a trend. This is the second time now. Uh, this is, seems to be at least in part a response to the grand jury and our response to the grand jury. And uh, this this feels like a very accurate response to the questions from the grand jury. What we said to the grand jury was, they said, do you have three days emergency storage? And we said, yes. And then I, <clears throat> I, I see that as similar to the water supply assessment that we discussed last month, which was also accurate. But it, then it had a, it had a summary which said, yeah, if there's a major drought, we can, we can handle it basically. Um, which I, I felt in both cases, the summary version of accurate information seems to me to have a rose colored filter on it. Um, so I'm concerned about that. Um, so 
I don't know. I, part of this might be just the timing of this. If we had this before we had to submit the grand jury response, this could have been part of our grand jury response. It's just two things. It's not it's not a long term trend, but I am concerned about whether these summaries might have some uh, level of rose colored filters. So. That's a very good point, Director Schmidt. And I, I wanted to just clarify that the way we define emergency storage is not necessarily how the grand jury looks at it. So you, you look at that line for fire storage. Um, if we go up to the color, yeah, that, that portion, um, it, it appears what the grand jury was looking for was adding the emergency and the fire together, right? And, and so what we did was we took out a bunch of storage out of the equation and said, that's gonna go to fire. And after the fires are put out, here's how much our residents will have, how many days of storage they'll have left. Um, but it appears that the grand jury look, uh, was looking for both emergency and fire. But the timing of this report uh, would have been able to uh, alleviate the question back to the grand jury. So that's a very, point, a very good point that you're making there, uh, Director Schmidt. But I just wanted to clarify the, the definition portion of it. So. It is helpful. Um, it sounds like that this, my um, guess looking at this is adding in the fire would not take us three days. No, so, no. So we're still at the issue of whether how these things are being being communicated. Thanks. Okay, uh, Lewis, you have your hand up. Yes, um, thank you. Um, what I was going to suggest, based on what Director Schmitz was talking about earlier about uh, the. Uh, to shut off the water, you know, special irrigation water. I wonder if we could coordinate something with the San Mateo County Emergency uh, Department because they they send out these cards what to do in an emergency, and people mm -hmm. hold on to those cards. And one of the and and Jubin is correct. Usually people talk about gas and fires and emergency that way. Maybe on that list they could also include you know, the shutting off of irrigation systems because water all of a sudden will become a, a, the most valuable commodity we would possibly have in a situation like that. And, uh, and if, it's, if it's on those cars, usually a lot of people, I mean, uh, I cannot tell you how many homes I went, even when I was in the fire department, that I have, they have that card, mm -hmm. you know, with a magnet on their refrigerator. And and the, the shutting off of irrigation system will be one of them. And people know how to shut off their systems, just like they learn how to shut off their gas meter and all that, you know. So, and that that could uh, hopefully uh, give us a lot of uh, uh, more time. A lot of, yeah, and, and a lot of exposure, you know, to with people to know what to do to safeguard from having water wasted, in a, in, especially during an emergency. One of the things that also came out of that grand jury report was that, uh, you know, as well as San Mateo County emergency response it is set up, they, they, they said that they needed to have a water desk. So they have established a water desk and uh, we were introduced to a person, I, I know his first name is Preston, I can't think of his last name right now, but, uh, you know, uh, he is already working on setting up some uh, meetings with uh, the different uh, uh, water and wastewater agencies in the county to do some training, emergency training. And so that could be one thing that we could bring up uh, is, you know, if there's a, an informational card that's out countywide, maybe, you know, might take a look at that, see if there's something that could be put on there to also include uh, the, the need to reduce outdoor water in, in a natural disaster. So that, that can also be looked at. Perfect, that's it, thanks, yep. Uh, Kathy. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so um, after Brian made those comments, it made me think, and I have a question that I, I'm trying to understand in my head. So um, based on Brian's comments, if we're looking at this kind of um, in a more positive light rather than conservative, conservative light, is there anything we can do differently? Because listening to Jubin talk about um, can't, that we can't keep the tanks full because the water starts degrading, where is the balance into not being not seeing it through rose-colored glasses, and then going to a point where water goes bad? Does that make, does my question make sense? It, yeah, it does, Director Jordan. Okay. I uh, I think 
I think the way we're approaching this is that um, the, the total storage that we have is a fixed number because of property costs and you know just the realities of living on the peninsula. But how do we optimize using our the storage that we have? So that's the approach that we're taking. So by introducing and installing a uh, booster station so we can add disinfectant into our water, we can extend uh, our cycles. And so we can reduce the band for operation and increase the, the, the emergence. So we could basically reduce the blue and make the red bigger. And so that's where we're headed in the next few years is that we're, we're looking at introducing these booster stations throughout the district. We're gonna start in Decoven, see how well that works and then maybe add one more. So as usage goes down and hopefully it'll keep trending down, um, that operation piece will get smaller and smaller, but then we can increase the emergency part of it and actually keep more water in the system by boosting the disinfectant within, within the district. So that's sort of the biggest step we're taking. I, I hope that makes sense um, uh, because the, 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 the total storage is a fixed number. Got it. Thank you. I, and I am going to probably want to meet with you separately Absolutely. to deep dive. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank I'm you. Looking forward to it. Okay. Any other questions? I'm not seeing anything. And so this was just a report to the board. Uh, there was no action, or there is no action uh, for the board to take. So I just wanted to comment and say I appreciated the report, Juven. I may want to pick your brain a little bit later on to, on Absolutely. the seasonality issue as to what these numbers are representing. But um, it, it, it gives us a much better understanding of, of some of the operational constraints that we're working with. And I appreciate that. Absolutely. Uh, if there are no other questions, we can go on to Section 8, 8A, our progress report from John Davidson. Yeah, so this is an annual report that John prepares for the board just to talk about uh, the, the website and the marketing and, and how we use our website. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to John. And John, just tell me when you want to uh, change the, the screen, the slide. All right, thank you, Rena. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm John Davidson, uh, sole proprietor for J Rocket 77 Design and Marketing. Uh, I have been managing the MPWD website, marketing, communications, PR efforts since uh, 2015. And uh, I want to thank the board for the opportunity to make this annual presentation to discuss uh, the past 12 months worth of uh, website and marketing efforts. Uh, to kind of provide a nice, as much as I can, a nice concise snapshot of all the different campaigns and efforts that we've been doing um, <clears throat> and um, uh, how we tied it into all the different staff members and uh, try to use all these efforts to uh, leverage the strategic goals of MPWD for, for a coming year. So um, yeah, Ren, I really appreciate it. If you can uh, uh, move these along as I cue them. Uh, and I do want to, uh, to invite the, the board to feel free to interject questions. Uh, I'm just simply going to be reviewing information that's already being provided uh, within the, uh, the board packet. <clears throat> so if there's any questions that you have already pre-formulated or have emerged, uh, feel free to ask them so that way I can answer them in the flow. Uh, and then um, if uh, at the end, I'll just you know, ask, any other, uh, ask for any other questions or comments. And then um, I think there might be some discussion about the water line after that point too. So, all right. So first, what I'd like to do is uh, you know get through the nitty gritty of uh, the web website and a lot of the administrative uh, administrative stuff. Um, these are the kind of uh, the hard data that we can kind of uh, put numbers to and um, look at metrics and such. And uh, so uh, every year I kind of uh, tend to kind of work at um, providing information about civic pay. Uh, this is the, uh, the the bill pay system for Mid Peninsula Water District, and um, uh, this was launched I think three years ago, and um, so we've been actually uh, tracking our efforts 
we've been doing a really good job of pulsing out information, uh, advertising, marketing to uh, the ratepayers uh, to you know to really push them to uh, to you know get into civic pay, you know use all the different options available through it. And um, <clears throat> uh, I think uh, when we launched, I think we jumped about 2,000 users within the first six months. Uh, we did a really heavy campaign, and since then we've just been doing very steady marketing through all different vehicles. We do it through the bill statements. Um, we do it through ads on the backs of them, promo cards, CCRs. Everywhere I can put an ad for civic pay, I do that. So uh, what we do is we really do focus on uh, not only getting people enrolled in the civic pay, but taking advantage of things like uh, you know going paperless, uh, using auto pay. <clears throat> and um, I think we, about a couple of years ago, we actually did kind of a cost analysis and kind of I think we came up with a number between 10 to $15 per rate payer that converts over to civic pay, or at least goes paperless, um, 10, to 12, uh, 10 to $15 a month that we save, the MPWD saves on costs uh, when one customer moves to uh, paperless. John, uh, so, mm -hmm. John those, those increases that you show on the total civic accounts, was that like within the last 12 months? Correct. Okay, all right. Yeah, th those numbers surprise me. These numbers are provided by Missy every year before I do the annual presentations, and I, I'm I'm always stunned. Just even let, every year, it seems like how how many more can we possibly add? And here we are. I I you know I'm still you know I'm still actually you know mind boggled about the uh, the addition of a thousand plus that have gone to auto pay in the last year. That's a huge boom. That's a huge boom for us. So that that's. Um, those are very healthy numbers in my estimate. And um, uh, we don't really have any good, you know, good idea of what's causing that, what's pushing that, um, other than just, we just keep on pushing advertising. We really promote this on the website. And um, I believe that Misty has indicated that um, we have seen a, a definite decrease in the number of disconnection notices. Um, the whole idea of, of pushing, you know, civic pay and stuff like that. And I think there's also been a lot of movement from uh, credit cards to checking accounts to avoid those fees. So I think we're seeing a lot of opportunistic access of uh, civic pay. But um, yeah, the, the numbers are good. I mean, we have seven out of eight, every eight, I'm guessing, ratepayer accounts are now using civic pay. Okay. So on that one, we'll move on to the next one real quick, and we'll talk about uh, the water watch. So last year, I believe we um, we were still uh, using Home Water Report, which was our online uh, portal for ratepayers to use to monitor their home water usage. Uh, this allows them to access daily water usage. You know, see how that correlates to you know the ambient temperatures for that day. Um, and this was actually provided to me as a, uh, a goal, uh, one of the primary goals uh, from MPWD last year to accomplish for 2022, which was to rebrand the home water report um, <clears throat> and make it a little more accessible, I guess you can say, to ratepayers um, and to try and encourage people to sign up. So I believe when we started uh, this rebranding program, I think we were at 750. No, we. We might have been about 700, 750 ratepayers were signed up for Home Water Report. Um, and since then, we've increased it, that number by 300. And uh, we've done that through aggressive uh, brand awareness campaigns. So we created the, the new Water Watch brand umbrella uh, for this and, um, you know, created uh, uh, some promo cards that we sent out directly. We've been promoting through bill statements. Uh, same thing with civic pay. We we try to find every you know square inch of space we can find in existing publications like the water quality report, the water line, um, and such. So we actually have it as one of the uh, MPWD customer portal items, so you can access it there. And um, uh, we actually did a, a really I thought it was a really successful promotional giveaway where we um, we sent out this promo card. You can see here in this uh, this page where we. Um, uh, we kind of incentivize people to sign up for Water Watch to sign up and uh, get a goodie, get a water conservation goodie, uh, especially something that's been branded with the California Way of Life. And you could probably see that if you zoom in, 
We had jute bags, we had t-shirts, we had uh, tile trackers, car wash coupons, and the like. So um, I believe we had 139 promo gifts redeemed. Um, and my target originally last year was to have 1,500 signed up for Water Watch by um, June of 2023. All right, so next one. This is just an overview of the MPWD publications that we do. Uh, these are pretty much the, 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 the three publications we do every year. Uh, excuse my typo over there for the waterline is the 2022 waterline, which is uh, just about ready to go to press. And of course the consumer confidence report and the water conservation annual report. So those three fixtures are printed and delivered to all the ratepayers every year. And the next one. Okay, we get into the website. So we'll cover the website in one presentation here. Um, uh, the, the, the website is uh, currently just humming along. We've done a lot of modifications to the website on the back end. Uh, and you can see that list right there. Uh, one of which is we've added the water efficiency tracker tool, which is not active right now, but we'll be launching, I believe on Friday, we'll be relaunching it. Um, we added the California Way of Life dashboard, uh, we added a dedicated elections page under the board of directors, and we've um, added a water waste report form so people uh, can actually get onto the website and uh, submit concerns about water waste that they're seeing in the community. And uh, we've also been doing a lot of standalone pages to support campaigns such as um, the, the rate increases or um, if uh, the division based elections program. Uh, the pass-through rates, whatever it might be, we, we, we're doing more standalone pages and creating a unique URL so we can funnel ratepayer set information and keep them updated uh, during the, um, the course of a campaign. Uh, there's also been a lot of stuff we've done in the back end too that not everyone sees, but we try to improve uh, the efficiency of the website from a man manage management standpoint. And uh, below I've actually created, this is the first year I've done this, uh, created a month by month snapshot of the performance of the website. And I know that um, one of the things I, I know that Tammy has liked to see in the past, which is uh, what are the most popular pages that people are going to when they come to the website? So I broke that out for every month and you can see that. So last year, um, I believe that we've seen an increase. Um, I'm not sure what, what that might be for. It might be because we've done a lot of campaigns this year, uh, like with the Water Watch, and uh, we had a lot of um, uh, campaigning for that uh, division-based election. So I believe last year we were at, I'm trying to get those numbers. I think we're averaging about 1,800, 1,600 to 1,800 users per month. This year we're at 1,936. Uh, the previous year we were at between 2,200 and 2,600 sessions. We're now definitely above 2,600 sessions per month. So we're, we're the, the website is, is going strong. It's uh, definitely staying in the course, very consistent numbers from month to month. Any questions on the website? All right. Next page. Uh, quick overview of MPWD in the community. Uh, now that the um, we're, uh, MPW is getting back out into the community and we look at uh, a stronger presence in 2023. And we like, um, we love the PR course of that, but we also more importantly like to be involved in the community uh, to show um, MPWD as a uh, strong participant and a positive force in the community, uh, which also kind of uh, dives into the um, special district um, philosophy, which is uh, at the core of a lot of the community involvement that we do. So you can see a, a, a small snapshot of what we've done in the past year and a looking forward to 2023. Uh, looks like Jeanette has um, more involvement for us in uh, not just the school programs, you know, uh, kind of lighten those back up again, but also um, I believe we're doing uh, uh, Belmont summer movies in the park. Uh, we just did the Belmont water dog run. We did a sponsorship for that and the Belmont farmer's market. And uh, next next screen, we had uh, two campaigns that came up uh, that kind of emerged. It was not, was on my radar coming in 2022, but I think we handled these really good because we have a, a really good architecture for handling 
uh, ratepayer communications for very important uh, uh, items like, in this case, the division-based election. So we ran um, promo card mailers. We had a web page that was updated, you know, every week uh, that allowed uh, people to dive, you know, dive into the um, uh, the hearings that we had for this particular item. We did some advertising in the Daily Journal. We did a lot of maps. We provided a lot of information to be as transparent as possible to get ratepayers um, as involved as possible. And I think that this program uh, came out pretty well. I think we had a little bit of involvement, but um, uh, but I think we did we did our due diligence on this particular campaign. Uh, we did a couple. Of, I think we did a press release on this one as well. Okay. Any questions about that? All right, Rena. And the next one was the pass through rate. So this was kind of a something kind of came up out of nowhere for me at least. So, but um, this one involved a little more. We, we've we've been uh, um, kind of fortunate to do zero rate increase promo cards every year, but this one involved a little bit more because we had to do a Prop 218 uh, diligence on this one. So we did a mailer, a trifold mailer that was sent out to all the rate payers. Uh, well within um, our time frame, so I believe we stay on schedule and didn't violate any Prop 218 um, guidelines for this. And um, uh, we actually did a web page. It's still up. I think it's still up today, but I think it might be under rates and fees now. Uh, we really kept uh, the, the rate payers involved and gave them avenues to get to the public hearings when they occurred. All right, next one. And then I'm going to finish off with the uh, California Way of Life campaign. This was the, my, one of my primary goals for 2023. This was uh, something that Jeanette and I worked on, have been working on now closely to make sure that we create this. Um, uh, this is a brand umbrella that we pray for all of our water conservation and efficiency um, uh, objectives. So we've actually put everything underneath this. So the California Way of Life was designed specifically uh, to kind of change the, the way we talk about water conservation, talk about water conservation as a way of life, as a lifestyle. Um, and, you know, that moving forward that we're looking at drought and water conservation on a long-term, um, you know, projection, that's not just a, a one or two year stint that we really need to kind of um, uh, promote and cultivate that uh, lifestyle or that mindset of conserving water. So. Um, we've done a lot of things in that regard. We've created the new California Way of Life dashboard on the homepage where people can get uh, specific information on a you know, timely basis as it occurs about water conservation and water efficiency uh, topics. Uh, anytime we provide resources such as you know, lands online, online landscape uh, uh, courses or um, it, uh, in, uh, the most recent one was the stage two water alert. So we put that in there. We have street banners. We did, we've done specific promo card mailers, uh, promoting things like the water use efficiency tracker um, and such. Um, and if you go to the next page on this, you'll see other efforts that we've done. Um, the water conservation tracker tool will be relaunching. We, we actually use that to show rate payers um, month by month how our water usage district wide is comparing to. 2021 or the previous year or two years ago or whatever it was, we're now uh, re-gearing it to show um, residential GPCD numbers, which I think are probably a little bit more relatable to ratepayers. And that will be launching uh, probably this Friday. And um, But we want to put that back up there. I believe that that's been um, a valuable tool for ratepayers. And it's a fun interactive thing on the website and that's always good to have. So. Um, We've had the updated web page. We actually keep this web page now, which is midpeninsulawaterorg slash save15. Um, we use that as a funnel to provide timely information to ratepayers. Um, in this last case, is the stage two water action. Um, we do a lot of billing statement ads that uh, touch upon different aspects recently, different aspects of uh, stage two actions that, that we need uh, people to look at. And on the next page, you will see how we also uh, put in uh, another program card mailer specifically for the water shortage level two. Uh, we created a handy little chart for the levels of action to show where we're at and compare that to other water level 
uh, water shortage levels of action that may or may not occur. And um, we actually brought back the water awareness calendar. Jeanette put that into the uh, best of. So we picked the best of artwork from the past and, and uh, created that mailer that went together with the water conservation annual report. And of course we did the California way of life um, uh, promotional items. A lot of this was wrapped up into the water watch uh, giveaways. Okay, and that's it for California way of life. California way of life is uh, basically a monthly way of life for myself when it comes to uh, PR and uh, marketing. So here are the goals for 2023. Uh, they really do center on water conservation, rate payer, community relations, and um, I think a revisit of the um, capital improvement program, uh, most notably uh, with the website. So all those items are there. And um, probably one thing that should be thrown in now after listening to the first part of this meeting is uh, disaster preparedness. That's actually something that um, uh, Jeanette, I have had on the back burner for about two years now, uh, and it's been on the back burner because there's been a lot of things that came to the front burner. So I'd be more than glad to uh, put that into my list of goals for 2023. And with that, let's switch over to the waterline, John, so you can show them the, the waterline, what we're going to be sending out to our customers here soon. Okay. Yeah, this is the 2022 water line. This is our annual newsletter that we provide to all rate payers. And um, we cover a lot of bases. We think this is a great way to uh, to promote everything that's happening outside and inside of MPWD. And um, so this year we did a, a full two page spread on just water conservation. And a two page spread on the compute, uh, uh, the capital improvement program. And uh, then we did a nice little wrap up of um, things are happening within MPWD with employees and with staff members that is and and such. This is um, slated to go to press probably early next week. We're actually in final approvals right now. And I was um, I just want to make sure that the board had a chance to kind of take a sneak peek at this before we send it out. Okay. So that, that concludes John's presentation. Were there any questions of John and what he's done to try and, and keep us uh, out there in front of our customers over the past year? I'm not seeing any hands. Matt, 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 Matt has his hand up. Oh. No, I was just going to say, I, you know, the, um, the look and feel of this and the consistency of that is great. Um, I mean, I, uh, although I don't know why we pick Seattle Seahawks colors, not that I'm a football fan, but that's the <laughs> only uh, issue that I think I have. Um, but uh, I mean, compared to the days when back when we were printing these things out in house, I think Lewis remembers that with a ginormous printer, the size of a pickup truck. Um, uh, and it had that sort of look and feel of, it was done in house and printed in house. Um, these are these are great. So uh, nice work. And Kathy was next. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment and uh, say thank you. I think that, um, but as Matt said, there's a lot of consistency. Whether it's what you see on the website or things we get in the mail, um, I personally really appreciate the website and how easy it is to use and how easy it is to find information. There's so many websites that you kind of go into a, a dark hole when you're trying to find how to contact people. And I think some websites do that on purpose, but I'm really pleased that we make it really easy for our customers to be able to connect with um, the district, whether it's uh, by phone or by um, website. So thank you very much for that. Okay, Lewis? Yeah, I just wanted to echo what has been said. You know, very professionally done. Uh, good job, John, on that. Uh, we talked about this before, so there's no need to repeat that. But uh, the question that I had, is, and this is maybe for Rena. I know that we're putting a lot of emphasis through the website and through the, the marketing that we have and all that on water conservation. Is there a way how to equate how much what John is doing is actually helping us. Was 
is there some way how to measure that? Yeah, some sort of analytics. I mean, that's probably a, a better question for John. John, uh, do you can you tell or can we do something, uh, you know, something analytical to try and see if there's a correlation between you know the information we have here and then maybe what we might see in terms of water water uh, use, you know, efficiency. Yeah, that's a, a, a tricky, tricky area yeah. there, of course. Um, I get monthly reports from Liftoff uh, as to, you know, how the website's performing. And um, uh, I, use that to, I use that kind of, you know, even though I show you the top five uh, pages are being visited to the website, whenever we do a campaign mailer, uh, whether it be like the Water Watch uh, program, we, we tend to watch the traffic go into those pages. That's, you know, um, that's one way of, of you know looking at response. Um, there we go. Yeah, so that's one way of looking at direct response to some of the the, the marketing we do. But in terms of you know whether uh, we're seeing more water savings as a direct result of this, you know, um, yeah. in a vacuum it'd be a lot easier to say that, of course, because yeah. the water conservation messaging and and awareness comes from all sorts of different uh, uh, places outside of the water district of course um but uh, we're looking at in fact we're going to watch that water efficiency tracker tool here um we're looking at oh i think i have them here if you want to wait just a half second it's kind of interesting these are numbers that Jeanette has given me comparing our water usage our residential gpcd per month to where it was i believe in 2020 um, as a benchmark and let me see if I can take a look at that. Here we go. So I believe like, let's say in October, I think uh, we're at showing a 62.2 for the RG, um, the RGPCD. And I think it was around 68 last year. And I think there was actually a metric there showing uh, July of this year, I think we're at 72 two years ago it was over 100 John you know I oh. you know technically I, I wasn't looking for an answer right now you know so oh, okay <laughs> but what I'm what I, what I am getting at is that ultimately the goal to do all of this if we're, if we're talking conservation ultimately mm -hmm. if we're going to throw all of this at people and people are not conserving then obviously we're wasting our time you do this right. so that people will conserve. Yeah. So, and, and this is not something that you're going to, you know, push a button and it, it's going to pop up in front of you. It, it takes time to, and, and you would need the help of, you know, staff, but, but it will be nice, you know, maybe once a year when you do this presentation, you could say, you know, we launched this program and we believe, and we have indications and it's not going to be an exact science. We know that we, we understand that. But we believe that with with this educational, we may have saved an additional five percent if we didn't do it. You know, that's our estimation, and that's what I was kind of looking at because ultimately, you know, you, you invest all of this in whether it's website, whether it's brochures, whether it's uh, flyers that we send out to get something out of your customers, and did we get that something out of the customers? Or mm -hmm. to what extent? That that's what I'm. That's what I'm looking. And I, and I was not looking for an answer right now, but during an annual presentation, it will be nice to have that tangible. Oh yeah, okay, so good. We did this and we achieved that. That's yeah, I, you know, I think there is a correlation there. We just I, we just haven't figured out a way how to, how to put a number to it. But I, I think it makes sense. But the, the tough part is trying to keep that information fresh, right? Because you have the same information year in, year out, year in, year out, it gets pretty stale. Correct. People, people get turned off by it. But I, I think if, uh, you know, you try and keep the information fresh and come up with new ideas, and we spend a lot of time, and, and John's very creative, and we've got some creative people here. I think that's, help, that's helpful. But, and I, so I think that, you know, combination of the, the mailers that, that we put out there, the information, the information on the website, the information we share with the board on a monthly basis, all that, you know, I think there are people interested in, in, you know, trying to see what they can do, and and it's helpful to them that we have information available to them. But just trying to put a number to that, you know, we haven't figured out a way how to do that, mm -hmm. but maybe eventually we will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no rush, and uh, and I and I do 
remember that ginormous copier <laughs> that, 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 that took out like a whole room, but and I'm glad it's not there anymore. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone else. Um, so I'd like to thank John too. I've been impressed with the web page and the, all the mailers, etc. And so uh, we appreciate your work. Yeah, thanks, John. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thanks Looking for coming to 2023. Yeah, good report. Okay, moving on to 8B. Uh, received Mezzi's and Hersom Tank Property Survey Report. And so this is uh, uh, another interesting, it's very similar to Folger. A couple of years ago, we had a property owner that's adjacent to the Hersom Tank up there and in the old Mezzi's Tank site that the property district still owns. And they contacted me about uh, acquiring some of the property that, uh, you know, for, for ex expanding their, their backyard. And they go, okay, you know, we've talked about this before. And says, well, you know, we, we can't give you the property. We have to go out there and, and do an appraisal of the property. And before we do that, we just probably need to go out there and take a look and see where our property boundaries look like. And lo and behold, it opened up a, a, another can of worms similar to, to uh, the Folger side in that uh, once the surveyor went out there and, and surveyed the district's property, we found that uh, this person and then a few others were actually encroaching on district property. Uh, and so you may recall when we last did this, we actually had a property appraisal for Folger and a couple of others. It, it cost a little less than $5,000 per, uh, per site to do that appraisal. So uh, part of what we want to do here is just uh, introduce the, the uh, situation to the board. You know, Jubin's here and Kat's here to kind of talk about uh, what we found out there. And then uh, just get some direction from the board. You know, do we want to go ahead and, and start with a property appraisal? We can do that. And then uh, once we find that out, come back to the board, share that with you, and then uh, possibly reach out and talk to these property owners. I haven't heard anything from any other property owners or even this particular one that contacted me a couple of years ago. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we, we felt that now the time is right just to bring it forward because it's been quite some time. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kat and Jubin. All right. So if you want to just scroll to the map, I think that'd be helpful. Um, you know, we're going to give a good overview. I just want to point out. So the Mezzi Tank site is here located on the right. Um, so that formerly held um, a relatively small tank, 150,000 gallons until about 1993 when it was demoed um, and that remains vacant. Um, and then the Hersom tank site on the left there, the much bigger one, that um, formerly held a 1 million gallon tank and then that was rebuilt in 2004 with a 1.5. Um, so if you actually scroll to the photos, photo three, um, or maybe it's photo four, the, the one, the overview of the Mezzi's tank site. Um, I think it's helpful to show you um, and maybe zoom in a little bit. So you can see um, the property actually extends beyond the fence here, but you can see that kind of round retaining wall that formerly um, you know, surrounded the tank that remains. It's holding back you know, a fair bit of earth for the houses above. Um, there's 1822 Mezzi's. They're the people who contacted Rena um, about, you know, potentially uh, buying the property actually for use as a garden. Um, but you can see actually once the surveyors went out, um, it was found that actually four different properties were encro or uh, neighbors were encroaching on our property. You can see some of the encroachment area here on 1822 Mezzi's. Uh, or from 1822 Mezes. And if you scroll back up, um, you can see the biggest encroachment area here. This is actually encroaching on the Hersom tank site. Um, 1802 Bayview has a portion of their driveway, these pavers um, that fall on our property. And if you scroll to the next one, you can see basically our, the property line is basically up to about their house. And so the 
this, you know, side yard, um, which, is, you know, other than the, you know, fences and the pavers isn't really developed, but, um, you know, it's being used. Um, so, uh, you know, there's the surveyor maps in here where you can see in detail, but I don't know, you know, if, uh, if the detail is quite as helpful. Um, the other one piece I wanted to point out was the access to the Mezzi site um, is either through our Hersom tank site or um, this narrow uh, stairway that falls between, and you can see it here on the map in the middle um, to the right, that's just a stairway that falls between two homes. Um, so it's really kind of very much a landlocked property. Um, and, you know, so the kind of question becomes, what do you want to do about this property? Um, we, you know, there's four neighbors in total that are currently, um, you know, using our property to some degree. Um, and, you know, we don't have any current plans um, to use them as a tank site. It's very small. It's hard to get to. It doesn't um, currently have, you know, a lot of utility for us, but with that big retaining wall, um, you know, it could have some liability as that uh, retaining wall degrades. Um, Herzog Tank property is, is another story that's very much in use and will be for, for quite a while. Jubin, you've, uh, you were out there with the surveyors, right? Yeah, so uh, if we could just hold off right there, I'll just add on to um, uh, Monique, I'd appreciate it if you just freeze right there without scrolling. Um, so it's it's really peculiar because um, the it looks like the house that is encroaching on our property onto the Hersom site was recently recently in the last 10, 15 years built, it, it, the, at least a portion that comes out towards towards our property. And, and now the the side yard of that property, how they access the backyard is is encroaching onto our property. And our property line comes up right against their their new addition. So I, I find it quite peculiar that the city didn't say anything when they were going through the approval process, but that's water under the bridge, I guess, at this point. This sits at the very top of our property line. Um, and so we don't necessarily use it, but uh, we certainly don't want to just give it away either, right? I mean, it's it's something that they're, 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 they've moved the fence and are physically using our property. Um, the other site, the Mezes tank site, which is to the right of that, is is somewhat of a dead property. It's sitting, as as uh, Kat was saying, is landlocked, and the encroachments have happened apparently over time. The fence lines were. It's kind of natural for people as they move into the house to just assume that that's where the property line is if they don't dig into the maps and 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 so forth. So they've extended their backyards into where the fence line was that we had over time installed uh, potentially. So um, it's it's sort of dead, dead, dead properties up there. So moving the fence line back isn't isn't necessarily that big of a deal, I think, on this one if if we want to. But the 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 other one, it does, it does, uh, it does, it is going to be an issue because we're going to be right up against their 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 house. So um, these, uh, and then lastly, I just want to say that the topographic survey <coughs> of these two properties, so there's a process where you survey it, but then you actually record it with the county, right? It's called a boundary survey. So it's a, it's a, it's a really uh, in-depth process where it goes to the county, and then the county uh, checks it to make sure it's done properly, and then it gets recorded. So that's how corners of properties or property lines are recorded and then and forever become records. So this wasn't just a survey, it, it was a boundary survey that got recorded with the county. So I just wanted to make sure that the board knew that we went through that extra step and it's now recorded and accepted by the county as are uh, the property lines out there. So I'll leave it at that. And if I could just add on, since this happened during my tenure as GM, um, we didn't go out there just to be responsive to the one property owner. Rena and I had talked for months about, or actually even a year, it, could this be a surplus property? Okay, and Jubin too. And that's the reason why we got it surveyed to initially. 
but then this property, I mean, and, and, and then we got triggered with this property owner. And the other thing I wanted to say is that the, the property owner that contacted Rena ended up building whatever he wanted without waiting on Rena to respond to him. It's like a little garden shed and a little play area for his children. So we, we actually physically walked the property, Rena and Jubin, and I think Michael was out there too. We all walked that property just so that we had, you know, a, a visual on, on what's there. So it was not our intention to discover what we discovered. But of course, it's it's our duty to report it to you. And then before we moved any further with regard to potentially getting the property appraised and all that, we needed to have this discussion with the board. So Rena, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything else. No, so thanks, Tammy. I think you covered it pretty well. So so now, you know, the, the question for the board is, you know, uh, would you like us to go ahead and uh, get some pricing on uh, some appraisals for the property so we get an idea what the value is for this Mezes tank site and then also uh, the, the Hurston tank site? And then we can bring that back and share it with you and then uh, talk about the next steps because now, now we're, we're talking about, you know, potentially property negotiations. And again, you know, probably very something similar to what we encountered when we talked to the, the people that are at, uh, on Soldier adjacent to our old. Uh, district office site. And for uh, Director Jordan's, hold on, let me start my video real quick. And for Director Jordan's history at Folger and for Cat at Folger, 1510 Folger, the property we owned, we were going to construct a fence and we were, we had had that property survey just like Juven just talked about with this property. And that's property we wanted to hold on to on that side of Folger, the other side we, we eventually sold. But what we discovered during that survey is that our fence wasn't on the property line. And so we were going to construct it, but there was a whole lot of stuff and encroachments by our neighbor. And so we notified them based on board direction. We actually got an, an MAI appraisal and we discovered that that little 440 square foot area was somewhere around 35 or $36,000 and they didn't want to pay. And they said they'd lived there for 10 years and, and they can't encroach on public property. They can't claim squatters rights. They don't have that right by law. And then we went back and forth, Julie and their attorney for Julie, what, a year? You went back and forth with that lawyer. And then we finally ended up finishing up and just saying, we're gonna build the fence. And that's what we did. And it, it, looks, it looks so amazing over there, um, but that's the board direction. And I wanted to remind the board of that and then give that little history for um, Kat and for um, Kathy. Anyone have questions for staff? Um, yeah, go ahead, Brian. Brian, let's just hand up. Sorry, no. And then I'll go. That was first, if you want to go, Matt. Uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I guess my two cents is it's hard to make a decision on what to do if we don't know what kind of dollars <laughs> we're playing with. So in terms of the question that we're being asked, yes, let's get an appraisal um but uh then i think we're looking at a very interesting conversation about who's going to buy what and how are we going to divvy it up um so i mean that that's that's not an easy pie to slice um but i don't know that we can have much of a conversation without getting that appraisal and if i could just point out that it's a the mezzi's tank site in particular is a strange, oddly shaped parcel. Um, it's small. And if you start cutting it up, it's going to get stranger and smaller and um, ultimately, you know, yeah. harder to, to get rid of all of it. So, but, I mean, so. you know, the value is based on what someone would pay for it to a certain extent. I don't know what someone's going to pay for that piece of property. What would you do with it? So, you know, what's your comp? What does it look like? All, all that kind of stuff is just weird. So, I don't. <laughs> I'm not even sure what numbers we're talking about here on a, on a per square foot basis. That's it. Okay, Brian? Yeah, it, one thought might be we might end up selling the property to one other landowner <laughs> and they figure out how to deal with these encroachments. We don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, uh, two questions. Uh, is it 
well understood that there's no longer any good storage value, water storage value on that property. I would yes. say, yeah, it, it's just too small. Uh, you know, we wouldn't benefit from, uh, I mean, we'd be limited in size for a, a tank there. I think I, I heard Kat say that it was like 150,000 gallons. I mean, we increased the size of the Harrison tank from a million to a million and a half. You know, we increased it 50%, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So uh, the idea was that, you know, we, we didn't know, we no longer needed this this old Mezzi's tank site. It really is a piece of surplus property. It's got a great view. I mean, the inside joke here at the district is uh, one of our one of our staffers, I think Michael's on the call or the, the meeting here, he's always said, I'd like to put a little house up there because it's got a great view, but that's about it, you know? And, and as Kat said, right now there's a concrete retaining wall that's kind of holding up a lot of soil back there. And it's it's a potential liability for the district, you know, over time as that wall degrades, you know, it could be a hundred years from now. But I mean, so there, there's that as well. The one that's going to be interesting is the one that's uh, the person that's got this 2,000 square feet of <laughs> property encroach. Again, as Jubin said, it's on the high side of the Hurston tank. You know, we're not going to put anything on it because it's it just got a nice steep slope there. But uh, you know, it's just interesting that uh, you know. Uh, somehow uh, they've encroached, you know, in over 2,000 square foot of public property. And it didn't come up under some kind of review by the, the city of Belmont, the planning department or the building department. I guess they did some expansion there recently. And that encroachment, is that the Menzies or, or, Menzies or is that the Hersom? This oh, one that I have up on the screen is the Hersom tank site. Okay. All right. That might answer my other question. I was like, we're not, we need Hersom. So why are we? Doing an appraisal of her, so is it to figure out what the value of that land? The is? value of that of that two thousand square foot is yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it seems to make sense to do an appraisal. Uh, Lewis. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I did uh, walk the Notre Dame property when we had that dispute on the fence and the rebuilding of the fence and the survey, and. My feeling on these properties are that uh, the property owners around it, they want that property for nothing. We end up spending money for appraisal, spending money us talking about it, spending us spending money for mapping it, recording it and all that, and won't even recuperate the cost to even get to the place. And then when we get to the price, um, those properties, they say, well, it's, it's not worth that much to me. So, and they wouldn't want to pay. And uh, so I, I think the first thing that we should do is probably talk to those owners uh, or to whoever is responsible and give them at least an idea how much this is going to cost, you know, uh, based on even the professional services that we're going to engage to even get to a, a, a correct price. Because my hunch is that once we get that, they wouldn't want to pay. And I'm kind of curious where that guy on Bayview got that uh, uh, phone booth from, I guess he got it from London, <laughs> transports it to here. I saw that one. There it goes. There you go. I wonder where he got that one from. <laughs> He's a Doctor Who fan. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I wonder if there's a telephone line active towards it too. <laughs> That's where he makes his private phone calls. I want a TARDIS. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, D Director Vela, I, I, I hear what you're saying as far as the three homeowners um, that have encroached on the Meze's tank site, and them might not they they not being interested in the in, in purchasing just the areas that they've encroached on. Um, it's relatively easy for them to go back to uh, not be encroachable, but this site in general, as Tammy stated, is is um, and and Cat also that. It is surplus uh, in that we we don't really have any use for it, and to be quite honest, as it's been stated, it is somewhat of a liability. So, uh, it, I I think we're looking at a couple of things. One is the actual encroachment, but uh, the other is that we we would as uh, staff uh, would like to get some direction as far as you know possibly getting this property surplus uh, and and see what the value is and sold in in some manner because. We we are not probably we're not going to be using the Mezzix tank site uh, in in any shape or form. And if you recall, a piece of surplus property that uh, a public agency like us own, we have to notify other 
agencies within the, the region here, public agencies of, of a piece of public property, right? We have the, the S Street property off of El Camino Real. Yeah. We're yeah. looking at, at getting rid of that, and we put it out there. It turns out that San Mateo County uh, Housing Department or whatever purchased it from us, you know, but that was after we let them know that that property was for sale. Yeah. Correct, any and Juba, uh, Rene and Juba, but at, at the same time, nobody on earth is going to be interested in this piece of property. Nobody, except the people who are around it, and the people who are around it. I, I don't know. Are not, I mean, are not prepared to pay. That that's my feeling anyway. So yeah. there's a zero parking, right? There's no the the the, the who, I, people are getting creative because land is so expensive. So I, I, I we don't. Know. Oh, wait, uh, wait a minute. I I, I stand corrected. Maybe uh, Mike Michael Anderson wants to build the, uh, a little shed up there, okay? No. Because it does have a nice view. I know that yeah. area pretty well. So yeah, it's kind of beautiful yeah, view yeah. today. It, it has, it's a very, very nice area. But anyway, that's, I'm not gonna say any more on that one. Uh, Kathy, you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I'll be brief. I think that um, we should, go ahead and, and pay for the appraisal uh, for a couple things. I'm just listening that it is surplus, surplus property. So we need to figure out what it's worth. But secondly, um, we have these neighbors who are, whether they know it or they don't know it, they're encroaching on our property and they will, you know, they maybe will have the option to buy it. We don't, you know, we'll have to decide that later. But secondarily, if I'm concerned, if something happens on this part of the property that's technically ours, where our neighbors are encroaching, that there's some liability issues for the district. And I want to avoid that type of scenario from happening. So likewise with um, the person on Bayview that we're going to need to uh, figure out. And I don't know how, you know, maybe these people didn't use permits. I don't know how it got by the city planning department, but uh, I just don't want to expose the district to any potential liability of something happening on our property. I did, I did want to mention that early on after the survey was filed and accepted by the County of San Mateo, I did reach out to Cheryl Villanueva. She's, excuse me, a local broker that has, has coordinated local or has coordinated our MAI appraisals in the past. Uh, we did order preliminary title uh, opinion, so we do have that. But mm -hmm. at the same time, she said this is a very interesting piece of property. Now, this has been two years ago, three years ago. And so she said it, it, it will be interesting to, to appraise this property. So I just want to give you the heads up, but they definitely can do that. Um, and then I want to go back to the discussion about what could you build up there? You know, as I'm sitting here listening to y'all, I'm just looking, going, somebody would figure out a way to do that. And then the last thing is now the Surplus Lands Act is different than it was when we yeah. sold Folger and F Street. And uh, Julie and I would have to go back, or Julie and Renna would have to go back and review all that. But there are now new rules with yeah. regard to that and maybe some more noticing. Julie, do you remember what yeah. more we might have to do now as a result of trying to surplus a piece of property? Yeah, I mean, I'll have to dig up my memo. There's, there are, there are definitely new noticing requirements and you have to do more with like looping in affordable housing agencies and you have to work with the state now where you didn't have to before. Um, so there's like a, a central agency that we have to work with. So it, I mean, it's all doable, but we have to make sure we follow the process. And just, you know, one thing on the liability, I, I'm gonna look into just if there's a notice that we should send out saying, you know, you're on our property, we don't want you there and, you know, use at your own risk, you know, if you're gonna be on there, so, something, because when I see that like tree house, for example, and I think about a kid falling out of there and it's on our property. I have a bad feeling about that. So I'll, yeah. I'll do some research and figure out if there's something we can do proactively in the meantime. Yeah, and that's the one he just built, as I recall, Renna, right? That's on the back side of that guy's property that contacted you. Yeah. Uh, with the sandbox and the garden shed and all that. Yes. So thanks, oh, Julie, really. for that. 
And and I would just I I want to echo one of the board members or maybe a couple of you that you know they deserve an in person meeting, not just a notice. I mean, we can certainly deliver the notice, but I I mean a cup a few of these neighbors know. Okay, so let's be let's be upfront about that. They they came out while the survey was out there. It was during COVID. What are you doing? Why are you pounding them? <laughs> spikes in the ground yeah, the, kind the of thing. Stakes, we, we, we did yeah. mark uh, remember we that did mark, we did mark the corner so they're, yeah they're, they're, and, 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 and they did kids come out it up and play yeah they it. did they did come out and ask and i remember specifically one of the properties that just has a tiny encroachment he said i'll move my fence i'll move my fence i mean he he literally said he knew so he already was aware that he was, you know, he's, he's got the tiniest, I think, of the encroachment. Yeah, that guy right down there at the bottom. So I'm just saying that, you know, they, they deserve, you know, that, I mean, I, I get it. They're, they're on our property. There's no doubt. But we certainly did not want to create more work for any of us, okay, by doing this. No. It wasn't quite an innocent act. An innocent but at act the same ever. time, yeah, we got to take care of it. And I just think they deserve the in-person contact when we deliver that notice. And I think that's a fantastic idea that Julie has to let them know. So it sounds uh, like we have direction to get the MAI. MAIs, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't think we have much choice going forward to avoid getting appraisals. Um, but it, it's really hard to imagine what some what the value of that property really is. Uh, Kirk, we didn't we didn't think they could come up with an appraisal for four hundred forty square feet, but they did. Oh After yeah, they well, but, I mean, they went but, and extenuated it, extended it, you know, to what that but, would cost them. But uh, on Folger, you at least could say that it's being added back into the main part of the property, and you yeah. look at the value of the entire thing, right. and you say, okay, on a square foot basis, what's the increment? Here, you look at this property, and it's got you know an old tank site and retaining wall. And there is absolutely no vehicle access. You can't build on it without hauling things up by hand. So how do you? I, I could see the city of the, the county. Idea. I could see the city of the county wanting to put a community garden or park back That's there. A park, I mean, you know, with a concrete, maybe becomes yeah. a, a, a skating rink. I mean, with the park. new rules, <laughs> I do or a skate park. I mean, yeah. I can just see. I could see them wanting to nab this for, you know, whatever they could get if they can if they have the funds. Yeah, uh, I can understand that, but there's absolutely no ADA access. There's no potential for ADA access. Called four so, wheel drive. <laughs> right. So I it's hard to imagine. Well, hey, they might they might be able to build a lift up that stairwell. Have you ever been over there, Kirk? I mean, it's quite the no, stairwell. I, I, the I saw the picture of it. And yeah, it's off of mazes if you're ever interested. It's very hard to find parking, but you can do it. Well, I can walk there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you can walk there. There it is right there. Well, you're free to do that. It's our property and public property. I think the gate is locked, right? I don't yeah, know if Michael's still here. Gate up on top, up on top yeah, Michael's still here. So I think Michael let us in there um, and unlocked the gate. Yeah. Can you hear me? I don't yeah. know if yes. You can hear me. yes. Oh, boy. I just opened up a can of worms right now. So I do want this property. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. But, I know. Um, it. I know. It. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, I, and I like what I'm hearing, but I, it's not going to happen. So I just wanted to throw out there, though, that. Um, the sliver of property off of the Mezzi's or Hersom tank site is actually, I don't know if we can find that picture. It's the picture of the, the pavers. Um, this one, Mike? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that portion of property, I know you, unless you go up there and actually walk the site and see it, you wouldn't know it. But that portion of property comes off of the end of Bayview and it's wide enough as a driveway approach to get down to the actual Mezzi's tank site. So there is, I, I see as a whole with all the slivers of property combined, I see a very valuable piece of property. I there really you do. go. We like that, Michael. We're going to have to remember so, that during your performance evaluation. I, Way to go. Well, <laughs> I, know, I know I just lost the, the opportunity to, to, to buy it, but, <laughs> but it's true. I, I really think as a whole, 
there is some serious value there, and I, I, I can't wait to see what it comes out to be. But I, I can't read how those contours work, but there's quite a slope. Uh, yeah, there. there is a slope, but it, but it, unless you walk it, like I said, unless you walk it and you see it, um, it's really hard to imagine just looking at the, the drawings here. Right. You know, that's such a great point. I'm glad you brought that up, Michael. Yes, Mike, thank you. Mike, are you looking for partners? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> 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 hmm. Maybe one of the uh, adjacent parcels wants to make an ADA unit or something. Yeah, an ADU, an ADU. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm glad Michael shared that. Though I'll make sure I, sh I share that with Cheryl and and let her know that because that's a very valid point with the ingress and egress issues to that property. And, and I don't know how much more it would cost to get an appraisal for you know everything combined as one versus each sliver individually. So, so we do the whole property that we own within those survey lines. And then we ask them for the extras about the values of these little hunks of property when we yeah. approach the people. So the board has that information when we take it back to them. That's what we did on Folger. Perfect. So we'll go out and get some MI appraisals and, and come back to the board when they're done and talk some more about this. Sounds good. OK. And thank you, Kat and Rena and Jubin, for getting this processed, and Michael for your input tonight, getting this move forward. <laughs> okay, so um, item 8C, consider voting delegate designations for the annual meetings, JPIA and AQUA. Yeah, so the fall conference is coming up here at the end of this month and the beginning of December. And so Aqua sent out a notice to uh, to us to say, hey, who are going to be your voting delegates? So I took a look at the, the board strategic plan, because you recall that's when you talk about voter uh, assignments for the, the different board members. And so for Aqua, it's just this one here. It's got uh, Brian and Kirk in there. So the voting members and then the GM is the alternate. So I just wanted to make sure that we're still on the same page. Kirk is attending the uh, the conference and and uh, Matt, you're still attending, but as an employee of, of Palo Alto, correct? And then Kat and I are attending. Correct. Well. <laughs> yeah. So uh, just uh, again, they, they have provided us with a uh, a form. Uh, where they, that they want us to fill out uh, and submit to them so that they know who they can anticipate uh, to be the voting member for the district. So I just thought it'd just be good to get it clarified before we get there. So that, that's all this is about. And looks right. like Brian, Brian's got his hand up. Brian? Yeah, I uh, appreciate that Kirk has been able to go to these. I have not, I won't be able to go to this one. I'm hoping if I end up staying on as a rep to be able to do it next year. But if somebody else wants to go to this one, then I think they should take my spot and we, we could take action here. Well, we only need one person to vote, so. Right, they only need yeah. one person, yeah. And Kirk, Kirk's on there to vote. I think you're on there, you're on there too, Yes, Brian. I'm not. I'm, I'm an, I'm an altern, alternate, but Rena should be named the alternate just in case one of you aren't there, for JPIA particularly. Yeah, so uh, I'm, what I'm suggesting here is that, you know, we just fill this in for the district and we put that uh, Kirk is going to be the, the director representative and that as the interim GM, I'll be the alternate representative. And then same thing for the Aqua general session, fill out this form uh, and again, put the voting delegates name that that would be Kirk and then the alternate would be the interim GM, which would be me and we'll just submit these so they have them on record. I, we just, I just got the agenda uh, for the, uh, the Aqua JPIA and it's, it's got Kirk in there already, but they still sent these forms. <laughs> so if, if the board's good with that, then we'll just go ahead and fill these forms out and submit them. Or if there's any questions the board has about this, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. And then you'll be doing them again next year. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's going to be another one in June or May. Yeah, that'll be yeah. in the, the Northern California, Monterey or Sacramento. Okay, we don't actually have to do any action on that. It was more of a discussion item. Uh, 
just to, you know, make sure that we're all in, uh, in uh, an agreement that that's, we're just going to fill it out with the board presidents, which is going to be there as the, the rep for both of these. And then the uh, interim GM as the alternate. Everybody's good with that. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Sounds good. Um, item 8D. Yeah, this Consider is just, and confirm yeah. our board meeting schedule. Yeah, for 2023, uh, something we do this time of the year. And so this is what's proposed. It's the uh, fourth Thursday of every month, with the exception of no meeting in August, unless the board wants to have a, uh, uh, a meeting in, in uh, August. Or uh, and then also in uh, November that we do the third Wednesday, just like today. And then in December, uh, the second Thursday, which is a little bit different than next month, but uh, again, just because of the holidays in November and December. Anyone have any comments on the schedule? I'm not seeing any hands. So we're good to confirm it. That's what we're going to use. Sounds that way. Okay. Yep. Looks Sounds good. good. Looks good. Okay. Eight E. Uh, the drop. Go for it, Rena. Yeah, so I shortened it up this month. I did. <laughs> There's just too many slides. So, uh, anyway, so this is the California drought uh, map to look, and just uh, looking at the top, comparing the current uh, areas of the state with last year's, you can just tell. And then I, I've been saying this that the areas of the state that are in the exceptional drought or extreme drought are, are a lot smaller in area for for that nomenclature than they were last year so that's a little bit better and it's even kind of shown in the the reservoir levels for the uh the, the state the major reservoir levels you know uh, uh last month i was just kind of showing i always i pick on the shasta which is the, the big federal uh reservoir you know uh in, at november the beginning of november this year it had 31 percent of its storage capacity Last year at this time, it had uh, less than that, and it had about a million acre feet stored. This year, they have about 1.4 million acre stored. So there's actually more water in Shasta this year in November than there was November 21. Uh, Oroville is uh, the other one we take a look at. That's the one that's the, the state's major water facility. Uh, last year, it had about 990,000 acre feet in it on November. Uh, this year it had a little over uh, a million acre feet, uh, so it's you know up slightly from where it was. And in talking with some people, what they're saying is uh, when uh, the state was releasing water last year, they uh, just released too much, and so this year they've been holding back a lot of water. And it's obvious because the, the reservoir levels are are up compared to last year. The Don Pedro Reservoir again, that's the water bank for the regional water system. The, the percentage uh, November this year and last year is basically the same, 49%. Uh, so it just doesn't change. And I think a lot of this has to do with because, again, uh, as the PUC operates that, they try to use the water bank, even though the water bank level is, is lower. And then the last one I typically point out is the San Luis Reservoir because that one's a big one. It's kind of close to us, and we might see it on our travels. Last year at this time, the San Luis Reservoir had about 327,000 acre feet this year. Uh, it's got almost 500,000 acre feet, so it's up almost 50%. So again, you know, the strategy for the state and the feds this past year has been to withhold some of the water and not releasing as much, and it's been painful for, for some of the uh, cities and county agencies and farmers who take water or have used water. I mean, they basically had no water uh, this, this year or much, much reduced uh, water available to them. And that's why there's a uh, higher higher uh, quantities of water stored. Uh, the the forecast we actually did get some some rain, so um, uh, but it wasn't the atmospheric river we had. Uh, if you recall, last year at the end of October we had that huge rain dump in in our region of California and in the, the Sierra Nevadas, and it really increased uh, uh, the water supplies that we did get uh, and made use of. So it panned out this year, you know, we just, uh, even though there's some some uh, precipitation, it just wasn't the same atmospheric rivers last year. 
the Hetch Hetchy precipitation, this is again, they, they use the water year to go between October uh, of a year to October the next year. So we're at the end of a particular water year. So you can see right here, this is the end of the water year. Uh, wasn't very good, much better than 1977, which is a terrible drought year, but well below uh, the, the 30 year median black line for precipitation up in the Hetch Hetchy region. The Bay Area uh, water stations that they monitor precipitation, the SFPC folks, uh, they've already they had the information for the beginning of the new water year. So if you look over here in October of 2022, uh, you know we had uh, six hundredths of an inch of rain in October 2020, 2022. Normally we have almost seven tenths of an inch, so well below that. So we did have some rain uh, in November. We'll see how that plays out. I don't think it's quite two and a half inches uh, in, in the seven station area, but it'll be interesting to see what it did play out. Storage. Uh, storage is uh, where, uh, when you talk to the SFPC folks, they're, they're just concerned that the, the water bank, uh, you know, it's, it's lower than where they like it to, to be. And so if you take a look, the last year, the water bank was at 63, almost 64%, or almost two thirds of its capacity. This year is less than half. And a lot of it has to do with just the availability of water from the watershed that was uh, available to the SFPC. It just wasn't there. And so uh, even though in, in a typical year, you know, I think the, the regional water system uses about a quarter million acre feet, you know, that's what they've got uh, stored right now in the uh, the, the water bank, the Dodone Pendro Reservoir. And when you talk to the SFPC folks, they, they have some concern that that's just a little bit too low and they're, they're hoping that this winter they'll be able to have enough runoff where they can start feeding some water back into the water bank. Uh, but generally speaking, com comparing this year to last year, uh, we're just down about 10% in terms of uh, water stored between uh, all of the different uh, storage facilities in the Tuolumne system and the, the local reservoirs here in the, the Bay Area region. Total water deliveries in the regional water system, you'll see they're just trending like they normally do this time of the year. They're starting to go down, not quite far uh, on, a, on a daily basis as 2015, but almost there at 186 million gallons per day that last week of August, uh, much lower than they were in 2020 and of course 2013. And, and again, you recall me mentioning, because we'd hear this from Mr. Ritchie, the assistant director, that they were hoping in the summertime we would be right around 200 million gallons a day. And man, we were pretty close. So they were happy about that. They're, they were they don't complain that much uh, uh, at the Bosco Water Managers meeting. And so, uh, well, hopefully we're going to get some, some rain and some snow this year. Now, here's a, a look at our uh, cumulative water use. You know, the SFPUC has set a water budget, this orange line here, of about 1.155 uh, CCF. And uh, at uh, the end of October, uh, we had used 986,000, and the SFPUC had budgeted for us about 987,000. So actually, this is the first time in the entire year that we've actually gone below what the SFPUC had asked us to try and target. Uh, so we're, you know, we're one tenth of a percent below, or about 1300 CCF below what the SFPUC's target. And I was just kind of projecting out for our normal November, December, and if it continues in that manner, we'll probably end up uh, about a, a one and a half percent below the SFPUC target for us. And again, comparing that with our, our five-year uh, average, which is about 1.2 million CCF, uh, we're you know maybe about five to ten percent below that. And it just got to give a lot of credit to uh, the, the community here, you know, responding to the the messaging from the SFPC, from us, things on our website, mailers we sent out to them. They're taking it to, to heart. And then here's a, a monthly look at that in a different way, just a uh, monthly water consumption. And so you can see in uh, October 2022, uh, we uh, took delivery of 97,000 units of water compared that with October last year is 101,000. So uh, water dropped off about, water just dropped off about four and a half percent. And you heard John mention our residential uh, per capita was at 62.2, there it is right there. That's information that uh, we submit to the state, and they they spit out this uh, uh, GPCD residential for us. 
So again, we're getting into the time of the year where our water demand just starts dropping off because of the cooler weather. Snowpack uh, for water year 2021-2022, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's been gone. We haven't had any snowpack uh, since, uh, you know, the end of June. And I think that is it. Are there any questions any, of any of these slides that I've presented to the board? Okay. I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you, Rena. Yes. Let's go on to the general manager's report. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, the, the general manager report, just uh, similar to what you've seen in the past. The only thing that we did a little, I did a little different here, as you recall, this part here, we were talking about not having an agenda item that talked about going back to the uh, the board meetings. There, there was a regular agenda item where there was a resolution that was passed, and it was a resolution that the board adopted back in 2021. And what we talked about is we would just make a note here, and, and Julie suggested this, that we put that here to say, hey, look, if there's nothing that's changed in the interim, we're just gonna basically say that uh, there has been no change and that we're still on track to have uh, a resume in-person meetings uh, be commencing on March, uh, 2023. Okay. And then next is the operations report. And I always like to point out just how busy we are doing uh, the underground service checks, you know, uh, locating our facilities. So in October, we had 356 requests for our utility locations. And you see the bar chart here. That was actually uh, an increase, uh, you know, it was one of the higher ones uh, over the last 12-month uh, period. So we're just constantly busy. That's, that's enough for one of our staff to just do that on a daily basis all the time. It just does not stop. Um, because of the uh, short window for getting prepared, we did have three system uh, leaks. We just didn't have the time to put all this information together. So uh, we will show the system repairs in our December report, and that, that will show the repairs that we made in October and also repairs that we made in November. And I think that's all I wanted to point out in my operations report. Let's say if the board members have any questions or something they saw in there that was uh, you know, something of interest to, to them. Rena? Yes. Um, in one of the items on the maintenance, you said that you conducted the fire sprinkler system at the district office. Yes. How, how did that come about? Any any issues that uh, you talked about? Yeah, I wasn't made of any, I made aware of any issues with the fire sprinkler system. You know, we have somebody come out there and there's a, there's a door outside the, the main office door where our fire sprinkler system is located and they go in the there riser. They, huh. Yeah, they do a check there and I wasn't, I didn't hear of anything. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just, just curious. Yeah, it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's very good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's go on, Assistant General Manager. Okay, so we haven't had a, a lot of time since the last board meeting, um, but one of the things we've been working on is um, this asset management system, spatial way, working with a consultant um, to get that going. We had our very first training this week. Um, we thought it was going to be on both valve turning and leak detection, uh, but it turns out it was actually they focused on just the leak detection module. Um, so Rena, myself, Mike, um, Victor Fung, and Jonathan Anderson um, all participated in this training. And I think, you know, we're all really excited with how useful it's going to be. Um, Mike and Jonathan had a couple of really good suggestions um, of ways, because it, it's very modifiable um, in this, this process right now ways that Spatial Wave could, you know, kind of tweak and, and features they could add specific to us that uh, would be really useful. So um, that's moving right along um, and we'll keep having these kind of small training slash working sessions um, to get this whole thing rolled out. Um, water rates where we, uh, we did some scenario modeling and um, we're getting kind of our final comments to our rate consultants back. Um, and then the other thing I want to talk about, and, 
and uh, Ren, if you want to scroll down, um, is drought tracking. So, you know, Ren's report talks about the regional water system and, you know, our kind of, uh, well, how closely they're watching storage. We sure hope it'll be a wet winter, but if it's not, and we have to eat into more of that storage, what's going to happen? So, you know, I'm looking at how we've responded you know, how our customers have responded to this drought so far, where the savings have come from. And if we have to, um, and we're asked by San Francisco to San Francisco to save more water beyond this 11% target, what's gonna be kind of the best way to get there? So this first chart here is kind of an inf infographic. Um, the orange bars you see in the background, that's basically our consumption uh, by our customers in 2020 by month, and then the blue is where we're falling so far in 2020. Um, and you can see, you know, in the summer, we've had more savings um, compared to the winter where there's just, you know, less opportunity to save. Um, and you can also see with the arrows there when SFPUC enacted their voluntary reduction, and then when the board enacted stage two and how the response um, has changed there. And then the line you see above, is the cumulative savings we've achieved relative to 2020. Um, so if you scroll, if you look at the next chart here, this is by each customer class where that savings come from in each month. Um, and so you can see kind of surprisingly, and, and this isn't necessarily all due to the doubt, drought, this could be kind of you know COVID and changing um, water use patterns, but the industrial sector itself has reduced their water use 46%. Um, Multifamily, single family, reduced 15 and 14 percent um, total. Um, but when you scroll to the pie chart in the bottom, this shows you collectively, because obviously our single family sector is so much larger um, than all the others, we're getting 60 percent of our total savings this year from single family, 20 percent from multifamily. Um, and even though industrials dropped it, call it, you know, almost half their 2020 use, that's uh, making up 12 percent of the pie. So, um, you know, this is just to kind of give you a little bit of a flavor of the type of analysis we're, uh, you know, looking at and thinking about and, you know, brainstorming with Jeanette on, um, you know, kind of ways to really kind of target our message where we'll have, you know, kind of the most effective um, savings if we are asked to go further than where we are right now. Any, any questions on that little overview? I had one question. I was curious if you had any idea why the, if you would scroll up one page there on the lower chart that April, we did badly compared to last year. Was it a rainfall event that shifted or there was a prolonged hot spell or something that all of a sudden we were using more water this year than last year in April? It was warmer, uh, yeah. you know, in the end, it was more irrigation um, because it was warmer. Um, and that's, you know, also when you kind of look at this and you think about enacting your next, next um, water storage contingency stage, if we have to do that, it's really important to think about the timing of that. Because, you know, if, if we're looking at a very dire situation and we get that message out and we get those restrictions out before a warm April, we have the ability to save that irrigation in April, where if we, you know, don't act until May or June, we lose that whole chunk. Right. Good. Thank you. Hey, you, you take a look at that green bar here in April. That green bar there is pretty large, and that's just all outside water. So it's here, here irrigation use that just went up. So there must have been a, a warm weather tick uptick. But that irrigation number is associated with parklands and other things like that. It's not general yes. irrigation. It is specific yeah. turf areas that we can meter separately. Right. That's right. Right. But Thank it is you. interesting, you know, being able to look at dedicated irrigation accounts. And, you know, if you are in an area where you have a lot of recycled water that feeds irrigation um, and you look at those kind of curves, they tend to track pretty closely with overall residential um, irrigation curve. So you can get a good estimate based on irrigation only accounts 
um, on what your other, you know, mixed meter accounts are doing. Mm -hmm. so. Anyone else have questions? Yeah, Kat, on the recruitment, uh, how is that coming along? I know you have a couple of positions that you are kind of interested in filling. So you tell us a little bit about that. We um, did make an offer and that offer was accepted to someone. Um, I'm really excited. That person uh, hopefully will start December 5th is the plan. So um, <coughs> I only kind of caveat it or couch it just because um, I have been burned in the past with people moving to this area, particularly people who are you know early in the career when they really look at housing prices. <laughs> And I have, uh, like I said, I've been burned where they backed out to kind of um, last minute. We're yeah. starting. So, yep, yep. We've all been through that. Yeah. But the plan is December 5th, we'll have that position built. All right. Which will be nice because it'll give that person an opportunity to, to spend some time with Jeanette. You know, she's the incumbent in the position, so to speak. You know, not, not the same job title, but doing a lot of the similar tasks that this person is going to be tasked with. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. Okay. If there are no other questions, we can go on to administrative services. I don't have a lot to add to my report. I would just say that uh, I've tried to add some of the utility billing statistics in here. Ron is good enough to put those together for us. And that's kind of where we are on defaulted payments, reminder letters, final notices, people sent to collections, and who, how many were shut off, which is the same. We're in the shut off process right now. Um, so I think that is tomorrow. We posted notices yesterday. I think it was yesterday. So can you scroll down one more page? And then uh, I will update the uh, various uh, certifications because people are getting them updated as theirs come due. I just didn't do it this time because I didn't have the certs at that time. So, but it'll be updated next month. And that's all I have. Any questions? Kathy. Yeah, I just want to make sure, Monique, that you received my additional, like the ethics. Yes, I have uh, them. Training as well. Okay, perfect. This was already published, though, by then, or okay, at least perfect. on the way to being published. <laughs> okay. But yes, awesome. I have them. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And what's the last one? Uh, district engineer. Jubin? Yeah, so I'm going to drag this out as long as I can to uh, prolong the, no, just kidding. I, I also want to say my ethics one should have been sent in to uh, Monique, so hopefully you have that one too, um, uh, because it's already expired, it looks like. So uh, nothing to report other than to say, since this report went out, uh, we did hear back from, from uh, uh, DDW, Division of Drinking Water for the Old County Road Project that uh, they have not approved our um, <clears throat> they have not approved our variance request so we're working through that and trying to figure out where to put this water main between some sanitary sewers and a 24 inch gas line that's on old county road we don't want to get close to that thing we don't want another san bruno so anyway that that's just a quick update on old county road but we're working through it okay any questions for Jubin? Seeing none. Uh, 9B, financial reports. So I mean, we're, we're going to- I didn't see any it. financial reports. Yeah, yeah we're, uh, we ran out of time and, and uh, Sheldon's been working on getting prepared for the audit and doing some bank reconciliations. So we asked if he could postpone that to the December regular board meeting. So you will have uh, the financial reports for the uh, for October and more likely also uh, uh, November at the December meeting. Okay. And then the audit report is scheduled for January or something? I uh, forgot. It'll probably be February. 
February. Okay. Uh, director's reports. I don't see anybody with their hand up. Um, Kathy does. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I do have my monthly meeting with Brenna prior to the board meetings, but I also wanted to bring up, um, I uh, ran into, and I think I'd brought it up a couple of months ago, but I ran into the city manager of Belmont um, on election night and kind of broached the subject. And I, I, I brought this up with Kirk and I, I'm assuming when we reorganize in December, we talk about kind of intergovernmental assignments and what Ashen mentioned is that on the city council, they do have an intergovernmental assignment to have a two by two uh, with the water district. And uh, I personally think it's a good time for us to maybe reinstate that. And maybe it with schedules being hard, maybe it's only, you know, twice a year. Um, but, you know, as we were talking about things um, this evening, um, one of the topics that we could discuss with in the two by two is, you know, planning, you know, doing some planning for a catastrophic, catastrophic event, because the city is obviously going to be involved, there'll be an EOC, and I think it'll be good for uh, us as another, a separate district to work with the city. And I think it's a good topic at this time to bring it up. So if you guys are all amenable to it, maybe we could discuss it in the reorganization meeting uh, next month and uh, appoint two people to be on the two by two with staff. That was it. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. The other item that uh, we probably ought to have as an agenda item with them is long-term water supply and the uh, voluntary agreement settlement that is going ahead for the Tuolumne and whether or not we actually have any further information on what that needs to our water supply in general. At least to keep them informed because they're starting an EIR process for their master planning for HIA, the Harbor Industrial Area. Yes, agreed. There's a lot of development going on in the city. So I think it's a good time. Let's see. Uh, Brian, you have your hand up. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll briefly that uh, I like Kathy's idea. Um, we're hoping that the city's going to do something on replacing some turf. So there's always some smaller scale issues that could be done. Um, so the only thing I just wanted to add is I just wanted to thank Tammy for helping me sort through some medical benefit issues. So that's it. Thanks. Welcome, Brian. No problem. Let's see, Lewis. Yes, thank you. So from, uh, so to Kathy, uh, Kathy from the city side, who on the two by two, who do they identify from the city staff as the two? Oh, I, yeah, I didn't ask Afshin. I just know he said it's part of their intergovernmental assignments and they're reorganizing in December, right? They're gonna have two new? Two new council members, I believe. Three, three new council members. Oh, wow. No, two, two new council members and a mayor. So I think they're going to have to do some appointments of intergovernmental assignments. So I'm not sure who mm -hmm. um, it would be from the city council. Yeah, uh, no, I know. I didn't mean the who the person, but the position, because if I'm not mistaken, when we used to do it in the past, it used to be the mayor and the vice mayor, whoever the mayor and the vice mayor were. But uh, I don't know how they're going to do it this time. You know, they may identify yeah. some other some other positions. All At right. my last meeting with Afshin several months ago, that's he said that's what it was then. It would still be the mayor, vice mayor, and mayor then him mayor. as city okay. manager. Yeah. Okay. But it could change, like Kathy's talking about. Yeah. I don't even know has the mayoral race been determined. I've been yes. checking. Oh, it yes. has. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. Who 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 was it well, that was successful? I think Julia, Julia. was. Yeah. Julie yeah, Julie, and then yeah. did the supervisor race get uh, determined yet? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm out of town, so I wasn't yeah. sure. Did it's, it get determined? Yet? It's, it's so not too. fully. It's not fully decided yet, but it looks like Noelia Corzo is going to win. Yeah, I think that's okay. what I. But it's not fully decided. But it's okay. about a, 
a one percent difference. Pretty now? close. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. pretty close. Yeah, but I, 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 I think today think... it went over two percent. Wow. Yeah, okay. it's trending. Right. It's trending every day. It trends more in her favor. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you. Okay, Matt, did you have anything? Um, yep, that's when my hands up. Um, so a couple things. One is um, I actually in the in, I don't know pre campaign whatever I had coffee with Julia. She seems interested in meeting with us, so I think we've got a different uh, a different leadership over there at the political level that you know um, maybe views the relationship slightly differently. So I think that's a good thing um and um and yeah it looks like she's successful i mean i did see too the one of the council races in san mateo the one council member went from almost a point down to a point ahead in two updates on the county website so there are definitely little pockets of votes out there it seems like that can swing these things but that was a, a smaller race than the supporter supervisors race obviously it was just one district in san, in san mateo uh, and the only other thing I wanted to add was for staff. Um, I was uh, uh, the fire marshal for um, uh, the SMC Fire, Linda Martin. I saw her name in the in the uh, one of the staff in the one of the reports. Um, I was actually in a uh, at a social setting where we were saying goodbye to someone that worked at at San Mateo, and she was giving the new deputy director of public works for Belmont who was a senior engineer that worked for me in San Mateo, who's going to be starting here soon, was giving her the lowdown on Belmont. And when she said, when she went to water, she says, water, you don't have to worry about water. Water's dialed in in Belmont. You're good. Don't worry about that. You got to worry about all the other stuff. So I just thought I'd pass on that from the fire marshal's perspective, you guys are dialed in. So that was it. Okay. Fire marshals are wise people. <laughs> I, I think take take that feedback with a big grain of salt from my standpoint personally, but uh yeah. Brian, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, I was wondering if we could uh have some agendized discussion when more is known about that uh settlement from that Rena emailed us about last week. Um, oh, and, the uh the MOU. Yeah. Okay, if we yeah. Could have more of a discussion of that. I don't know yeah. if it'll be next month or after, but whenever you know more. We know more, and it may be something that uh, we might even be getting Nicole to come talk about. You know, she knows uh, more about it, but yeah, sure. Great, thank you. Lewis, you got a comment? Yeah, just a quick comment, last comment. Uh, since we're talking about elections and uh, differences in, uh, in voting in Redwood City, in one of the district, the difference between two candidates was First, it was one vote, and that's not 1%, one vote. And then it was two votes. And I think it was decided by just two votes. So I thought I'd mention that. And the other thing is that I am so pleased to be uh, attending this meeting at a decent hour instead of the ones that I attended last month. So <laughs> thank you. That's it. That sounds like a self-inflicted problem, though, Lewis. You're not going to get much sympathy. Right. I wasn't looking for sympathy. I was just, it was a statement. That's all. Okay. I think that's everyone but me. Um, other than the agenda meeting, I did go to HIA this month. And uh, most of the development stuff we know about has been going on and they were all interested in uh, some of the issues, uh, but they had a presentation by one of the board of directors from the Santa Clara Valley Water talking about uh, essentially expanding their water reuse system to uh, reuse you know, tertiary treated water yeah. to yeah. recharge groundwater and uh, essentially try and uh, get it back into the potable water supply system. So uh, it sounds like more of a long term project for them, but they are definitely looking at it going forward. 
because they do have a lot of recycled water that they can hope to find a home for. But it's very similar to the prep project the SFPUC is looking at in a lot of respects. Yeah, they right. just have a lot more water to dilute it with in a lot of respects too. So, and I did take note of the price tag on that project, which was seven hundred fifty million dollars. So very comparable to the prep project. But he didn't actually say much about how much they were actually going to get in terms of acre feet or gallons per day uh, with that. So it's hard to tell. But outside of that it, presentation, I don't think he was successful in his re-election campaign. Ah. Um, at the at last one I checked, he was behind fairly substantially. I, I don't know what the current results are. He has conceded. Okay. So, um, item 10, communications. Are there any communications we need to hear about right now? No, sir. Okay. So, uh, why don't we take a five minute break and come back for a closed session? Did everybody get Julie's link? Yes. Okay. okay. Wait, wait, wait. I, I did not. I'm, I was looking for it again. I did not. Julie, can you please send it again? Uh, yeah, let me let me forward that. Well, you. I mean, it's probably because it didn't get sent to his home email. So Rena can probably forward that, Julie. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm right. sure Lynn sent it to his, you know, mid pen. Yeah. yeah. Rena, you're going to do that? Yeah, I'll take care of it. Okay. We'll see everybody Thanks. in a few minutes. All right. Thanks. Okay. Good night. There he is. How are he? All right. We can be in at 1021. And adjourn at 1022. Hi, Kirk. Hi, Kirk. You are muted right now. Okay, I'm there on you mute go. now. There you go. So uh, I believe we have nothing to report from the closed session. That's correct. Yeah. In that case, we can go ahead and close the. Uh, Adjourn. Adjourn. Yeah. Great. Okay. Right. Have, a, have a great night. Good night. Everyone. Yeah. Have a good have Thanksgiving, have Thanksgiving if I don't see you. Yes. Thanks. Thank you both. Bye bye. Good, good night. night. Okay. Bye bye.